centuries. On Resurrection Sunday, the church would greet one another with the words, He is risen. He is risen indeed. So let's greet one another with those words. He is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And all the people of God said, yes, baby. I mean, amen. 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 We are so glad that you have joined us on this Resurrection Sunday. It's always a special day in the life of the church as we celebrate the reality that death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him, and that he is alive and well. In our bulletin today, you'll find several bits of information. Uh, one is a purple sheet that shows the different people who have given uh, to purchase Easter lilies. Our building is filled with Easter lilies. And even outside the door, we have some Easter lilies, and we thank you for contributing to the beauty of this time of day, year for our church and for Jesus Christ. Also, twice a year, the Church of the Nazarene asks people to give a sacrificial love offering for the cause of world missions. And uh, people who respond to the call through the Church of the Nazarene, they are appointed as full-time missionaries, and they are dependent upon the church to uh, supply their needs, including salaries. So uh, a love offering uh, is appropriate, a sacrificial love offering, if you would place it in this envelope and put it in the, in the uh, white boxes, it would be deeply appreciated. I'm off center today. Now you say you're off center every week, Pastor. Well, I'm, little, I'm off center from here. Uh, just to give you an update of why I am here, it's been an interesting week. It started Wednesday morning, and as I went to step back to finish my shower, the bat mat slipped, and I hit very hard. Uh, went to the emergency room or to the place. There are no broken bones, praise God, but I am still in tremendous pain, and so I'm going to limit my movement here today. What is really, God has a great sense of humor. While I was waiting for them to read my x-rays there at the uh, center, Charlene texted me. She hadn't felt well since uh, Monday evening. And I got a text that said, I just did a COVID test and I tested positive for COVID. So she's not here today. This is her fifth day of isolation. So uh, I'm off center. She's home. But you're here. <laughs> And we are glad you are here. We are going to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ together. And Peter, as he writes the church that's experiencing some very difficult times, in the opening of his first letter, the first chapter, the first verse, he says, listen to me, people of God. We need to praise. Praise the God and our Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. We're not only born again, but we're born into a living hope. And the assurance of that is the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is a certainty and is a fact. As we gather together today, we want to focus on our living hope. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your perfect plan. And we rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ was obedient even unto death on the cross. But we also rejoice in the fact that you, Heavenly Father, confirmed his part and confirmed your plan. Because even though sin required the death of the spotless lamb, the truth is the grave could not hold him. And we have victory victory in Jesus Christ. So as we sing together today and as we read the scriptures and as we pray, may we truly celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ the Lord is risen today and may this building be filled with terms like hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And all the people of God said hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's sing together. If you'd like to stand, please stand.
Christ the Lord is risen today. Ah, alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Ah, alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Ah, alleluia. Sing ye hymns and earth reply. Ah, alleluia. Lives again our glorious King. Ah, under the weather this week, um, and it's spring break, so that goes to figure. So uh, I've been uh, fighting whatever this is, so sing out. Okay, I can't find my song. Um, sing out kind of goes along. I was surprised I even knew my name this morning. So um, we're going to sing In Christ Alone. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, the gift of love and righteousness. Torn by the ones he came to save. Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. The ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then 
bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. be engaged in it uh, so that you can really grasp the insight that is found in it. Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 1 and coming down through verse number 10. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Something took place prior to their arrival there. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Now we pick up the story with Mary and Mary arriving at the tomb. And they see the angel, and the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Now I have told you. Verse 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, still afraid, yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. Verse 9 and 10 is where we're really going to fall and focus on this morning as we open up the passage. But suddenly, King James Version says, Behold! Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. 
Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. A familiar story. Once again, I encourage you to have a copy of the scriptures open because we are going to look closely at some of the words in verses 9 and 10, and they are going to give us tremendous insight into what the story of the resurrection and the reality of the resurrection is truly all about. We continue to sing. We're going to sing another song that in a beautiful way describes God's plan the plan that uh, living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away it's one of the great contemporary hymns of the church once again if you'd like to stand as we sing this song together One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glory. Day, oh, glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. The nails for me Living he loved me Dying he saved me Buried he carried My sins far away Rising he justified Freely forever One day he's coming Oh glorious day
reign he justify freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day glorious day oh glorious day Amen. Amen. We're going to prepare to go to prayer at this time, and we're going to sing the chorus of Because He Lives. Because He Lives, I can face tomorrow. Whatever tomorrow brings may not be easy, but with His hand, my hand in His, we can face it, right? Amen. Altars are open. I know there's flowers there, but if you want to come, we can always move those out of the way. morning thankful for the fact that we can have a peace we can have joy we can have a hope just because Jesus Christ is alive and well we do thank you for your plan and we thank you Jesus Christ son of God for your participating in the plan we rejoice in the fact that you came as a sinless lamb and you offered yourself as a sacrifice for all sin. But we're also grateful for the fact that you not only died for our sin, but you live so that we can experience joy and peace. And Lord, that's our, that's our desire today. That's what we seek today. We don't want to look to the past. We want to look to the future. And we realize the key to the future is not only the cross of Jesus Christ, but the empty tomb and the fact that Jesus Christ who came out of that tomb ministered for a period of 40 days and appeared to his disciples and then he ascended into heaven and he is even there. You are there even today, Lord Jesus. And you're interceding on our behalf. You're whispering our names into the heavenly Father's ear. And we just ask that to today we would not just celebrate Easter with family and with different activities, but Lord, give us the grace to experience the goodness and the fullness of the resurrected life. 
We thank you so much for the hope that we have. We pray for the prayer requests that have been uh, distributed to those who desired them. And we pray that you would just touch those, those people, those needs, those situations. Lord, do your work. Do it your way. And Lord, we pray that the living hope of Christ would just permeate every situation. And Lord, as we come to you today, uh, there are others who may not have shared the information. But as we are gathered here today, just like that first Resurrection Sunday, there was confusion. There was fear. There were questions. But by faith, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. And our prayer is today that we would have the courage to take our journey to the tomb today. And Lord, we pray that we would realize that as we make our journey, you, the resurrected Lord, are excitedly anticipating meeting us. And so, Lord, our prayer is that this would be more than just another Easter Sunday. But, Lord, our prayer is that the truth of Matthew 28 would just come into our very minds and the Holy Spirit would come into our very hearts and we would experience a fresh, dynamic encounter with the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Again, thank you for this time together. We pray for those who could not be here. Lord, we have those who are part of our congregation who would have loved to be here today, but because of illness and because of circumstances, they could not be present. Be very real to them. For those who have joined us online, Lord, may it truly be more than just a time of watching a sermon, but may your Holy Spirit use the streaming of this worship hour the streaming of the music, the streaming of the prayer, the streaming of the proclaimed word. Lord, may you use it to bring glory to yourself and to bring transformation to life. Lord, as Peter says, we praise our God for the living hope that we have because we've been given a new birth, a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and because he lives we can face tomorrow we pray that together in christ's name we celebrate together because he lives i can face tomorrow because he seated thank you for your engagement in worship today and now as we open up the scriptures i invite you to get even more deeply engaged with the word itself again i encourage you to get a hold of a passage or get a hold of a bible uh, maybe the person next to you has a, a we know they have a phone and they may have a bible app but i would encourage you to not only Listen to what I am saying, but you would have your eyes open to the words that are found in uh, Matthew 28, verses 9 and 10. And most of all, that you would open your heart to a new insight into the initial encounter that we see. The initial encounter of humanity, the initial encounter of two women, the initial encounter with the resurrected Christ. Dr. Gordon, pastor of the church, and 
One Easter, he brought an old, beat-up, rusty birdcage and sat it next to the pulpit. As he gave his sermon that Easter morning, he held up the cage and said, You might be wondering why this is here. As a matter of fact, that's not the normal part of an Easter service, having a birdcage here. But I want to tell you the story behind it. Uh, several days ago, I was noticing a little boy in tattered and torn blue jeans, a dirty t-shirt, a ball cap off to the side, and he was whistling while he walked down an alley, and he was swinging this bird cage. Clinging to the bottom of the cage were l very little field sparrows that he had caught. So I stopped him and asked, son, what do you have here? Oh, I've got some birds. What are you going to do with them? Oh, mess around with them, tease them, something like that. Well, I asked, when you get tired of them, what are you going to do? He thought a moment and said, well, I've got a couple of cats at home, and they like birds. I think I'll just let them go at them. Dr. Garden said, Gordon said his heart went out to those little birds, so he made an offer. How much do you want for those birds? Surprised, the boy said, Mister, these birds ain't no good. Well, regardless, how much would you like for them? The little fellow said, Well, how about two bucks? Sold. So the pastor reached in his pocket and peeled off two one dollar bills and the little boy shoved the birdcage forward, pleased with his stroke of good fortune. When the boy left, Pastor Gordon walked a good, di good distance away, lifted open the little cage door, said, shoo, shoo, and he shoved those birds out the door, and they flew free. Then he said this, You see, this empty bird cage is the perfect illustration of how Satan had the human race trapped and frightened. But Jesus Christ not only paid the price for our freedom, Jesus Christ has set us free. Amen. We are gathered here today and we often, when we come together at a setting such as this, we talk about the fact that Jesus Christ has indeed died for our sins and he paid the price for our sins. However, we seldom go beyond that fact and look at the total scripture or teaching because Jesus Christ not only paid the price for our freedom, but the truth is he has set us free from the power of sin. Amen. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 9 and 10, we have described for us Christ's initial appearance. It's the first appearance he makes to any human beings following his resurrection. And not only is it unbelievable that Jesus Christ rises from the dead, but his initial experience is to two women. Now, in our culture, that's not quite so surprising. But in the first century culture, that was truly unbelievable. And not only does he reveal himself to two women, the first one named is Mary Magdalene. And we don't have time this morning, but if we had the time we could look back and we would discover that Mary Magdalene doesn't have a very pretty background. In fact, her life was a dark, chaotic world. The truth is, Satan controlled her life. And what we find is that she made her way to Christ, and Christ delivers her, and her life is changed, and her life is so changed that she and the other Mary on the day after the Sabbath 
very early in the morning, they go and make their way to the tomb where Jesus' body has been laid. They really assumed that he was dead still. And what I would like for us to do today is to look at this initial count encounter between the resurrected Christ and people. And what I want for us to understand is that this initial encounter between the risen Lord and people establishes the pattern of all of Christ's appearances, not only in the scriptures, but for 2,000 years, including us. This is more than the story of Easter. This is the reality of three very important facts, a part of any revelation of any experience of Jesus Christ. First of all, I use the term already, it's revelation. Verse number nine begins with the word, suddenly. If you have a King James version, it's the word, behold. Other translations say, J.B. Phillips, then quite suddenly, Young's literal translation, then lo. Remember the account in Luke of the announcement of Christ's birth? And lo, the angel of the Lord appeared to those shepherds. That's the same word. Suddenly, behold, amazingly, there is a revelation of of good news and what the new testament writer matthew wants us to understand as we move into verse 9 and 10 of this account he wants us to realize that what we read here is really really important don't miss it keep your ears open have your eyes open have your heart open, because this is really important. And it says, behold, suddenly Jesus met them. <sighs> Let me give you some of the background of this term. Jesus met them. It's a term that reflects the reality of great anticipation. It's a term that says that Jesus not only come to these women, but he comes to them with an overwhelming excitement. The resurrected Lord is going to come to two ladies, and as he comes, he comes jumping up and down with great anticipation. In his own heart and in his own mind, there are fireworks going off. I mean, this is a fantastic time. Jesus Christ is so excited because he, the resurrected Lord, is going to meet, he's going to come and meet two people. And what we need to understand is this aspect of revelation. And everything that we have experienced in our lives, everything that we know about God, anything that we have received from God, we need to understand that it did not begin at our own initiation. It began because God moved on our, on our behalf. See, we get the idea that, well, he's up there waiting and Someday I will go and meet him. Matthew says, no, I want you to understand something. I want you to understand that God is not waiting on you. The truth is the resurrected Christ, he is going to meet you. God is in control. And every day he is working. He is excitedly anticipating the fact that you will experience him. Amen. You see, God is the one who's moved. God is the one who is moving. 
God is the one who will continue to move in our direction. And one of the things that we have to realize when it comes to revelation is that God reveals himself to us. We don't seek God. God seeks us. We don't go after God. God goes after us. It's not about what we do. It's about what God is doing. See, God is on the move, and we get in on it. The scene in the garden after Jesus' resurrection is not about two ladies meeting Jesus. When you look at how the passage unfolds, you begin to realize it's about Jesus being thrilled about meeting two people. And see, that's his nature. That's what he's all about. He delights. He jumps up and down when he has the opportunity to step into a human's darkness, into confusion, into the person's chaos. In fact, that's his whole purpose. That word met, it's a military term. Jesus met them. It's a term that describes a military confrontation. It's not a chance meeting. It's not an accidental meeting. It's the picture of Jesus and his plan intervening into a life with a distinct purpose. That distinct purpose is that we would experience our divine destiny. And please hear this. Christ's purpose Our divine destiny, his divine destiny isn't just to get us to heaven. There is absolutely no mention of their experiencing the resurrected Christ so that they can experience life after death in heaven with the Lord. The purpose, the divine destiny, the purpose for life that Christ offers us is that his kingdom be formed in us, and day by day, his kingdom would flow through our lives. Jesus met them. He has a purpose, and he's so excited. He's jumping up and down. I get to meet two people today. It goes deeper, though, because not only does it say that Jesus met them, His first word is greetings. The root word has the idea of rejoice. It implies joy and gladness. And, you know, I really expected when the resurrected Lord, who just, you know, experienced verses 2, 3, and 4, I really expected him to say, Hey, ladies, here I am! Look at me. No, you know what he does? He uses a casual greeting that's used in day-to-day conversation. See, that's how his style is. See, the problem is we get stuck in Old Testament revelation. Now, you know, We like to go to Exodus chapter 19, and there we read how before there is the giving of the Ten Commandments, uh, the people of God are on Mount Sinai, and chapter 19 of Exodus verse 16 says, there's thunder and lightning, and there's a thick cloud over the mountain, and there's a very loud trumpet blast. Yeah. Wow. Wow. But the New Testament picture of God is not like that. Please understand that Matthew is the first of the Gospels. And Matthew's purpose is trying to introduce to Jewish people, people who had anticipated the coming of the Messiah through the prophecies and through the promises of the Old Testament. And he says, 
He has come. And what I want for you to realize is that in verses 2, 3, and 4, we find that there is a violent earthquake. We find that there is an angel from heaven. We read that the stone is rolled back. We read that the angel was seated on the stone. We read there's lightning, that the clothes of the, of the angels are white as snow, and guards trembled, and they fall over like dead people. I mean, that sounds like the Old Testament. But you know what? It's interesting. And when I read it, I pointed it out to you. Mark, Luke, and John don't say anything about the thunder and lightning and the angel and the angel seated on, on the rock or the stone. See, he, Matthew has a purpose. His purpose is those of you who are caught in Old Testament thinking, which is, oh, a God who thunder and lightning and a cloud and ooh, wow, ooh. I want you to know something. The God of the New Testament, the God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, he is the real thing. But his style and his way is very different. You know what his style is? Good morning. How are you today? He comes. He comes very powerfully yet very subtly down at the job. He is present. He comes. He meets us at the school. He meets us in the grocery store. He meets us in our homes. We're talking the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, what about those angels? I'm glad you asked. You go to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 through 14. Once again, notice it's a writing to the Hebrews. And in the Old Testament way, in the Old Testament faith of the people, angels were very important. And as the writer of the Hebrews begins his declaration of the fact that Jesus Christ is superior, he begins his letter, he begins his sermon by saying, oh, by the way, Jesus Christ is superior to any angel. And in verse 14 he says, angels are ministering spirits, but Jesus Christ is superior. He is the Son of God. Amen. And please understand Pastor, are you saying that God doesn't provide guardian angels? I am not saying that. But what I want for you and me to understand this morning is that when you look closely at the revelation of Jesus Christ in, in, the, in the resurrection account, the reality is God is moving and he doesn't necessarily move through an angel who may minister to us. The revelation of God is that he is going to move in the everyday situations of our lives he is Jesus, the Son of God. And rather than looking for an angel to stand beside you, respond to him. Respond to him. It's revelation. Now, this passage doesn't stop there. If that weren't enough, he goes on and we read there that Christ comes to them and he's jumping up and down and he's so excited about it. And he says, greetings. It says there that they, the women, came to him. So here's the truth again. Because God comes to us, we can now come to God. Sometimes... Uh, when I study contemporary teachers on how to preach in the 21st century, they say, you know, you shouldn't refer to the Greek New Testament or the Hebrew Old Testament because it's too scholarly. Unfortunately, 
we miss a great deal if we don't have someone to help us. Because when you read it, verse 9, it says, Jesus met them, and then it says, they came to him. It's like, oh yeah, Jesus and then they. There is a very little word that starts, that introduces that the women came to him. It's H-A-I, it's high, and it's such a small word, and it seems so insignificant. But what it means is, Jesus met them, and moreover, furthermore, the women came to him. In other words, because God has been moving, and Jesus has come to meet them, his purpose is going to be fulfilled, and that purpose is that they come to him. And it's a different word. Jesus' moving is not the same as the women's moving. The way of faith. We make it so difficult. We ask all these questions. Well, what about this? And what if, the, you know, just think of it. Here is the scene. The way of faith is really quite simple. God moves through Jesus Christ. God speaks through the Holy Spirit. And you know what we do? We respond. Jesus speaks. We respond. Jesus speaks. I respond. Imagine what it will be like when you get to the gates of heaven. Oftentimes we have this idea that we come to the gates of heaven and there's St. Peter with the checklist. All right, you went to church once in a while? Check that one off. Uh, you dropped the $20 bill in the offering and you were there. Check that one off. You don't smoke, drink, or swear. You don't chew and you don't go with girls who do. So we'll check that one off. When, you know what I think? Christianity reacting to Jesus Christ, responding to Jesus Christ, is not a to-do or not to-do list. It's he speaks. And I respond. And that word there that they came to him, this is beautiful. It's the idea of consenting to or submitting to. He reveals himself. He's excited. He's jumping up and down. He, he's come to us. He wants to have, uh, have us experience his, our divine destiny and his purpose for our lives. He's so excited. And what do we do when we enter into his presence? We simply consent and submit. He speaks, and I respond. And even gets richer. Not only do they come to him, but it's really interesting. It says that they clasped his feet. Again, a very rich word. It's a word that means seizing. It's the word of restraining with all of one's might. It's the picture of, I've got a hold of you and I'm not going to let you go. They come to Christ. And when they come to him, their re reaction is that they grab a hold of him by the feet and they so hang on to him that they're not ever going to let him go. Jesus, you're never going to get away from me. I'm going to keep you in the center of my life. I'm going to keep you in the center of my thoughts. I, you're never, uh, never going to get rid of me. I am going to hold on to you no matter what. You see, the response that opens God's amazing transformational grace is, hey, I'm never going to let go of you, Jesus. And then it says they worshiped him. And I thought, you know, I need to unpack that word worship maybe this morning. But then I thought, no, I don't need to. In fact, I will encourage you to apply it. Because notice it says that they 
took hold of him and they grasped him by his feet. They held on to him and they said they never let go. And it says that they worshipped him. See, you know what you worship. What do you mean, Pastor? Whoever, whatever it is that you will hold on to and refuse to ever let go, that is who or what you worship. It's the initial encounter. Jesus is so excited. He's going to interact with these people, these two women, and they respond to him. They submit to him, and they grab a hold of him, and they say, I'm never, ever going to let go of you. You are going to be the center of my life, and when you speak, I'm going to move. And when you say, let go of that, I'm going to let go. When you say, release that to me, I'm going to release it. And if that weren't enough, look at verse 10. Because we see how the passage moves. The passage moves from a revelation of Jesus meets us. Till we see the reaction of we come to him. And now we read of relationship. And the relationship is seen, first of all, in verse number 10, where Jesus says to them, don't be afraid. And the context is so amazing. Verse number 4, as those guards experience the 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 earthquake and the angel and the, and all that powerful description of the power of God who's resurrecting the resurrecting Christ the God who moves the stone away from the front of the tomb you know why he did that not to let Jesus out right. he moved the stone so you and I could look in right. and it said that they were so afraid, they became like dead people. You come down verse number 8. It says there that the women hurried away, and they were filled with joy, but they were still, what? They were still afraid. Wow. But then Jesus comes, and as they meet him and as they grab a hold of him and as they respond to him he says don't be afraid see there's the reality there's no fear because the living lord is right there in their presence would you please hear that we're so glad that jesus died for our sins but please realize, though we may be experiencing the fact that Christ paid the price for our sins, a life of faith includes being set free from fear. And fear no longer controls every aspect of our lives. And rather than fear controlling every aspect of our lives, we are maturing in our faith. And faith is giving way to, or fear is giving way to faith. And the living Lord is present to these two ladies. And therefore, fear is no longer a reality. When Jesus is dead, when we don't think he's there, there's nothing but fear. When Jesus is alive, attitudes, perspectives change. When Christ is not present, there's nothing but fear. But when we experience the reality of the living Christ, it is a brand new day. Amen. Nothing may have changed, but my perspective has changed. Yeah. He's not dead. I'm thankful for the fact that he died, but I'm truly filled with the fact that he's alive and well. Yeah. And he's right here with me. Amen. 
And my perspective is different. My attitude is different. I'm no longer controlled by fear. I no longer worry about this and wonder about that. And oh, Lord, please say change things. No! He's alive. He's, he's right here. And to put the icing on the cake, he not only says, don't be afraid, he says, go tell my brothers. Do you see relationship there? Again, the contrast is amazing. Verse 7, go tell his disciples. Verse number 8, they were going to tell his disciples. They refer to the fact, well, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. Jesus speaks and says, oh, by the way, this is all about relationship. And it's not just being a Christian and you say you follow Jesus. I want you to realize we're a family and I want you to go tell my brothers. My brothers, Jesus Christ is my brother. Relationship. See, the good news of Resurrection Sunday is you and I don't have to be what we currently are. We don't have to be what we currently are. We can rest in a personal relationship, a personal relationship with our brother, Jesus Christ. And not only does he say, tell my brothers, it even gets richer, this whole aspect of relationship. They will see me. See, the first century people had been led astray. And they were confused by religious teaching. You see, the religious leaders of their day, the Pharisees, taught that God wants to take you a bad person and turn you into a good person. God wants to make you like me. See, I'm no longer a bad person. I'm a good person, and God wants to take and make you like me. They had also been given the idea that when you become a good person, that you can become so perfect and so wonderful that you're like a statue. And you're a statue that they put in the corner of the church. And you don't ever accomplish anything and don't do anything, but you're there in the corner of the church and people can look at you and say, ooh, ah, isn't that amazing? That was the confusion of the first century. And the teachings of the religious crowd You'll discover as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read the ministry of Peter and Paul and the apostles in the book of Acts, that religious crowd continued to be a royal pain in the patootie because they missed it. Not a bad person into a good person. Not to be so shiny and so perfect that I sit there in the church and just kind of people ooh and ah. No. God's purpose through Christ is intimacy. A relationship with the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. A relationship that is possible because of the fact that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, has moved into my life. The bottom line, as Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, he begins the Sermon on the Mount and says, oh, by the way, you want to get on on this? You want to know what, the, what it is to be a part of the kingdom of heaven? Just be poor in spirit. Be totally dependent upon me. Stories told several years ago of a little boy he lived in a small river town, small river village. And uh, one day he was thinking about God and 
the little boy thought, I wonder, can I really see God? So he went in and his mother was washing dishes and said, Mom, can I, can people see God? And the mom kind of him hawed around. And said, well, 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 I'll tell you what, let's ask the pastor Sunday. And so they got to church Sunday morning and the little mom took the little boy and so the little boy asked the pastor, Pastor, can I, can people see God? And the pastor took the little boy into his office and he pulled down a couple theology books and he opened up the theology books and tried to explain what theologians talk about, the possibility of seeing God. And after about 30 minutes, the, the little boy left and kind of went, what was that all about? Jeez. Again, it was an isolated river town. And to get to the main town of the, of the county where you did all your shopping, where things took place, he took a ferry across the river. And so one day, as he was going with his mom across the river on the ferry to do some shopping, he went and asked the captain of the ship. He said, sir, could you answer me a question? Can you see God? And the ferryman just continued to hold steady, and the little boy thought maybe he didn't hear him. So he said, sir, can you see God? Still no response, and the little boy really wanted to find out. He was looking for the answer, so he asked the third time, can you see God? And with tears streaming down his face, that elderly man turned and said, it's getting to the point where I can't see anything else. Which is a great summation of the initial encounter of Jesus Christ with two women, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And what I want for us to understand, that it is more than a story of the first resurrection Sunday. It sets the pattern of how even today, after century after century, throughout church history, there have been individuals who were so tired of religion and so tired of the frustration of trying harder and never getting anywhere, there are people who understand the fact that it is an encounter with Jesus Christ who's jumping up and down and wants to make a mark in our lives. And the key is we, we submit to him and we respond to him and we grab hold of him and refuse to let go of him. He speaks and I respond. And we enter into a relationship where I'm not afraid. Jesus is my brother. And everywhere I go, he's all I see. Again, the good news today is this. You don't have to be what you are. You don't have to struggle. Fear or faith. Worry or faith. You don't have to be defeated. You don't have to feel alone. You don't have to try to figure out how to fix this life. Jesus Christ today is so excitedly revealing himself to you and he is simply inviting you to submit and take hold of him. See, the risen Lord is offering you faith to replace fear. And he wants to begin to take you on a journey where 24-7, 365, you're experiencing the reality of becoming so intimately involved with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that you've gotten to the point 
you can't see anything else but him. Jesus, It's amazing. You were so excited to know that we were going to have an opportunity today to meet with me and to meet with every person who's hearing these, these words that I'm sharing. God, you are moving. You have been moving. You are moving. You will move. Jesus, you're so excited because you want to impact our lives. You want to do us from this day-to-day gutted-out existence and take us to the reality of a divine destiny every moment of every day. And Lord, we, we confess that we weren't too excited about coming to you. And the truth is, we often just uh, treat uh, coming to you very lightly. And to think of you involved 24-7, 365 in my life, I mean, that's just so... That's so out there. That can't be true. And Lord, I, I'm willing to be religious. I, I will come to church once in a while, but uh, Lord, make sure that the preacher doesn't go over an hour and 15 minutes for the whole service. You know, we've got things to do and people to see. Lord, would you please forgive us? The truth of Holy Week, the truth of the cross, the truth of the resurrection, the truth of the ascension of the Lordship of Jesus Christ is all about God so has moved the entire world. He's changed all history for us. And so today, Lord, we just pray that we would experience your movement in our lives and your coming to us. You're meeting us. And Lord, give us the grace to understand that there likely will not be any thunder and lightning. Or, no, you're just going to show up there at the house when, when we leave the dessert in the oven too long. And it just messes up the whole Easter dinner. You're going to meet us there on the job. You're going to meet us there at the school. No fireworks. No big smoke. No formations in the sky. Just Jesus in the marketplace, in our homes. Lord, may we not get caught in the trap of religion. May we not get caught in the trap of trying to move from a bad person to becoming a good person. Help us to not fall to the trap that there's always someone worse than we are. Lord, that is a religious description of life. That's not a Christ-centered way of faith. May there be a host of us today who have a fresh, a fresh encounter with the resurrected living Lord. May we enter into relationship. May you become a part of my family.
May you become a part of our daily lives. May we be so intimately involved with you and you with us that no matter what happens, good, bad, ugly, no matter what happens, all I can ever see is Jesus. Today is a day where Christ has revealed himself through the word. I've encouraged you with everything in them, me to open your eyes and open the book to see the words, to move beyond the story, but to encounter the Christ. And now as we come to the close of this hour, it's the time for you and me to respond. As he speaks, what will I do? As he speaks, how will I react? The truth is, by faith today, we can choose to move beyond worry and fear about tomorrow and to, by faith, allow Jesus Christ to become the center of my life where I let go of everything else and hold on to him. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. When the family goes back home, when all the leftover ham and turkey and all the Easter eggs have been found, I can face tomorrow because even though the holiday is over, every day has now become a sacred day, a holy day, because Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. He's not only holding on to me, I'm holding on to him, and I'm never going to let go. As we sing through the chorus, because he lives one more time, I'd encourage you to take a step of faith. And I'll encourage you to take a step of faith. I encourage you to tell someone. Because if you try to do it on your own, you'll struggle. And the truth is, It'll be very easy to say, ah, but we're, you become a brother with Christ, but we also become brothers and sisters, and we're a family. And not only will Jesus never let go, we want you to experience him, and so we'll never let go of you either. We will love you. Let's sing together. You respond as Christ moves in your life. something. And life is not worth living. One more time. We sing it to him. We worship him. We grab a hold of him. Something I know, I know him. And all the people of God said, Hallelujah! He is risen. We're going to pronounce a benediction. I'm going to stay right here. If you'd like to converse with me, I'd appreciate if you'd come to me. Uh, I'll scream and holler as I try to get to you. So uh, I do love you. I thank you so much. This is, I begin today my fourth year as your pastor.
And uh, God is good. And all the time. So uh, I'm going to pronounce the benediction. If you'd like to converse with me, please feel free to come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross, Jesus. Thank you for resurrecting the Lord, Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for making the resurrected Christ a reality in my life. And all the people of God said, Amen. 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 Enjoy resurrection living. <laughs>